Hello there, this is Xiao, and welcome to the final episode of my 17-part series on getting a great vocal sound. We've come a long way from where we started, and I hope you've learned something about performance, recording, and mixing. Last time, I introduced you to limiters, gates, multiband compressors, and de and showed you how to use them. If you haven't seen that video yet, go check it out. In today's tutorial, I'll be going over some extra tips to help you make the best mixes you can. Again, lots to cover, expect a long video. So let's get started. Mixing. In my video on mixing equipment, I explained that studio monitors and acoustic treatments make mixing easier because they help you hear things more accurately. But there's another way to do that. Reference mixing. Reference mixing is where you make comparisons with your mix to make sure it sounds good in as many situations as possible. There are five scenarios to reference against throughout your mixing process. First, listening at lower volumes. As I mentioned in the compressor video, people tend to think that louder sounds are more pleasing to listen to than quieter ones. To combat this, mix at a lower volume level. But I encourage you to take this one step further. In addition to mixing at a relatively quiet level, try occasionally making your mix way quieter than normal, like by at least 12 dB. Because things are so quiet, your mix won't be artificially flattered by loudness, which will make it much easier to hear things that don't sound right, like if some sounds are way louder than others or if the frequency balance is off. Plus, if you can get your mix sounding great when it's quiet, then it'll sound even better when you turn it back up. I actually have a volume knob plug-in on my DAW that I keep turned off until I need to reference at a lower volume. When I turn it on, it reduces the volume of my entire mix by 16 dB, and then when I'm done, I just turn it back off. Super easy. Most DAWs come with a trim or volume plug-in. If yours doesn't, you can always just use the output gain on any plug-in that has it. Next scenario, listening in mono. In my levels and panning video, I explained that panning helps get instruments out of each other's way, and helps make your mix sound wider. However, panning and stereo only make a difference if the listener is in the right spot. If the listener is, say, farther away from the sweet spot of the speakers, they won't hear a stereo sound, they'll hear a mono one. Further, many sound systems combine the left and right audio signals into one mono output. So, check how your mix sounds in mono, even if it's just for a little bit. Listen for instruments that sound quiet or strange as a result of the mono summing, as that could mean stereo problems. Some producers like to do their entire EQ process in mono, because it helps them EQ their instruments out of each other's way. Most DAWs make it really easy to switch your mix to mono, whether using a control on the track or a plug-in. Another scenario, listening on different speakers speakers. All speakers alter the audio. However, they each do so in different ways. As such, check your work on at least two different sets of speakers. Each one will reveal different things about your mix. Studio monitors, computer speakers, headphones, earbuds, crappy $10 speakers, whatever works. Next, listening in different spaces. Like speakers, the listening space alters the audio. So, move around. This could be as simple as listening at the other end of the room or down the hall from your mixing spot, or as involved as playing your mix in your car or at a friend's house. Last, and most certainly not least, listening against reference tracks. Most beginner mixers have a hard time telling if their mix is good or balanced. The mix may sound great to them, but when they compare it to another song they like, their mix sounds nothing like it. So, take a song you really like and pull it directly into your DAW for a side-by-side -side comparison. This gives you a goal for your mix, something to shoot for. Further, assuming your reference track was professionally mixed, you can use Use it to overcome any problems with your speakers or your room, because you'll have a reliable point of comparison for things like low-end and high-end balance, or the loudness of your drums or vocals. So here are some quick reference track pointers. First, turn down your reference track so that it's only as loud as your mix, to prevent the whole louder is better thing. Second, try to choose a reference track that's in the same genre as your mix, because every genre mixes things differently. Third, have multiple reference tracks, because even in the same genre, people mix things a little differently. Let each reference track serve as a boundary for each part of your mix. For example, say you have two reference tracks. One track has a louder vocal than the other, so if the level of your vocal is anywhere between the vocal level for those two songs, you'll be on the right track. Finally, I encourage you to choose songs that were made by someone else, rather than yourself, preferably ones that were professionally mixed. It's not really a second opinion if the second opinion 
opinion is your own. Now, I've been focusing mainly on reference mixing for musical purposes, but a lot of these can also be applied to creating vocal effects, especially using reference tracks. If you're trying to create a specific character's voice, it makes sense to have an example of what that character actually sounds like. So basically, by making comparisons with your mix, you can zero in on problem spots and make your mix sound good in as many scenarios as possible. Let's move on. You're probably well aware that doing physical activity for long periods of time will make you tired. What you may not know is that listening to loud audio for long periods of time will make your ears tired. Ear fatigue is what happens when you've been listening to loud audio for two, three, five hours on end. The main effect of ear fatigue is that it becomes gradually more difficult for you to hear audio clearly and accurately. And because mixing involves very subtle changes, this is a big problem. So here are some ways to fight ear fatigue. First and foremost, mix at lower volume levels. Not only does this reduce your brain's tendency to prefer louder sounds, but it also causes ear fatigue to happen more slowly, and it helps reduce the onset of hearing loss. It's a win-win-win. So how quiet should your audio be? Quiet enough that you shouldn't have to raise your voice to have a conversation with someone sitting next to you. So pretty quiet. Now, it's okay to listen at louder volumes for a little bit, because that can make it easier to hear certain parts of the mix, like the low end. But only do this for about 10 to 20 seconds before turning it back down, or else your ears will start to fatigue. Also, quick clarification, when I say lower volume levels, I'm referring to the output volume of your speakers or headphones. You don't have to do anything special with the volume faders in your DAW. Another way to reduce ear fatigue is to take breaks. Every 45 minutes to an hour, take 5 to 10 minutes and do something that doesn't make a lot of noise, like check email, get a snack, stretch your legs, whatever. If it helps, set a timer so that you remember to take a break. Last, do your best to mix on speakers as opposed to headphones. Yes, headphones are good for referencing and recording and allow you to mix without bothering people around you, but they're much more prone to ear fatigue because they're right next to your ears. So, if you have a good set of speakers, use them. Now, if you've seen any of my tutorials, you've probably noticed that I make a lot of recommendations about how to get good results. These suggestions are based on research and personal experience. However, every suggestion I've given you, and will give you, is overridden by the most important rule of all. The master rule. The master rule of audio engineering is, if it sounds good, do it. Even if you break every rule in the mixing engineer's handbook, as long as the results sound good, nothing else matters. And now I'm sure many of you are thinking, but if that's the most important rule, then why make all those recommendations? My goal has always been to help new producers get on the right track and make great audio. And the best way to do this is to teach you the basics and provide suggestions. However, I encourage you to take my advice, and indeed all audio-related advice, with a grain of salt. Why? Because for Every tip, rule, and guideline you discover, there's a situation where it does not apply and might even give you bad results. Don't over-compress your vocals, unless you're compressing a vocoder. Don't boost or cut on your EQ by more than 6 dB, unless you're making a Dalek voice. Don't hard-tune your vocals, unless you're making GLaDOS. So should you learn the rules of good mixing? Absolutely! But don't be afraid to break those rules if you know that you'll get better results by doing so. There is no right or wrong way to mix. It either sounds good or it doesn't. Do whatever it takes to get your audio to sound the way you want it to, even if that that means doing something drastic. If it sounds good, do it. With one key exception, don't do anything that could jeopardize your health or the health of others. There are potentially hazardous things you could do at any stage of the production process, from performing a metal scream without proper training and practice, to recording underwater with non-waterproof equipment, to mixing at really high volume levels. Yeah, I'm gonna keep stressing that. Yes, you want to get the best results you can, but please don't hurt anybody, yourself included. Just be careful, it's that simple. But how do you know what sounds good? That comes down to personal taste. Your tastes will develop over time and will get better with experience. But the best way to develop good taste is to listen to things you love, whether that's great music, great voice actors, or cool special effects. Listen, learn, and be inspired. If you want even more mixing information, check out The Recording Revolution, Home Studio Corner, and Beat School. There are also a whole bunch of mixing-related tutorials on lynda.com. Links to all of 
these in the description. Before I go, I'll leave you with this thought. If you remember nothing else from this video, remember this. There are a thousand ways to mix audio, but only one that's right for you. Find what works best for your ends, learn it well, and you'll be able to make something amazing every time. Anyway, that concludes my series on getting a great vocal sound. If you liked what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you want more information or have any questions about reference mixing, ear fatigue, or the master rule of audio engineering, comment below. I'm always open for questions. Also, let me know what you think of my new intro. And as always, if you'd like to request a VoxFX tutorial, please send me a message. Remember, if it's talky, I can talk about it. So what's next for VoxFX? Well, now that I've covered the basics, I'll be getting into some of the more specialized vocal effects and voice-like sounds. If you've seen any of my vocal effect tests, you should know what to expect. However, some of these are pretty complicated, so I'll be starting with the simpler ones and building up from there. I'll also be responding to tutorial requests here and there down the road. With all that in mind, next time I'll be explaining delay, and how to use it to spice up your vocals. Until then, have fun and keep making sound. Box FX. <laughs>